I love getting my hands dirty. I love knowing the ins and outs of whichever business I'm in. But there's something very satisfying about farming. I mean, you grow yes. this thing and then it feeds people. If this is what I'm paying, my, my payment terms with my supplier, how then does that affect my operations and then my also my payment terms to my to my clients? Because I have that phone and so I want it now instead of saying how can I build up to that point. Hello, I am Tamima and this is the Real Talk Roundtable. And today this marks our very first show in this new year and of course the new decade. And very rightly so, our topic today will be touching on finances. So on the Real Talk original show, we actually had a show dubbed Smart Money and got overwhelming feedback from you about how we can get you started in restructuring your personal finances. So my first guest is Maureen Lungahi. Maureen is 31 years old and she is a business owner. Maureen, welcome to the Roundtable. Thank you. So 31 business owner those words sounds like th those words sound like a dream for a lot of people not not really <laughs> I think it's it's the direction that I chose and um, anybody can get into it so have you always been in business uh, no I started out in employment and then four years ago I branched I branched into business so what inspired you now to sort of like decide I no longer want to be employed but I want to run my own business well I come from a family of business people and so I, it was very natural for me to progress into business, yes. And did you always know the type of business that you wanted to get into? No. Frankly, I did not care. <laughs> I just knew I, I wanted to get into business. So I, I got into the, the business that I'm in right now. And which business are you in? I'm in the meat supply business. Yes, so I supply meat to institutions and hotels. So how did you finally end up now landing on that particular area? Well, it's, it's interesting because a friend of mine introduced me to it. She was leaving the country and she sold the business to me. So she held my hand for a few months and then left, left me to run the business. So at the juncture where your friend now is approaching you, she's leaving the country and yeah. she wants to sell the business to you because she didn't mm. hand it over for free. No. So what thoughts were running over your mind? Because you have to pay some money and in this case that was your capital yes. into this new area that you had literally zero experience with mm -hmm. yeah well at least i had um i had her with me and uh, I'd, i saw how she, how well she was doing and i wanted to do it and when the opportunity presented itself i i gladly took it so when it came to buying the business mm -hmm. of her what mm -hmm. made you confident that if i put my money here i'll get my money's worth because it was a running business and was it profitable yes Yes. So finally there you are and now you're getting into the meat business. Yani ukakuwa kama sasa wanaita Kenya Meat Commission. So who are you selling the meat to? So initially I bought a butchery mm -hmm. and I would sell from the shop until that and then that wasn't enough for me so I decided to get into meat supply. So I approached hotels and then I got business from them. So what your friend handed over to you was the butchery? Yes. So she didn't hand over to you the meat distribution? No. That part you expanded yes. yourself? Yes. And so what was that like now, taking over the butchery mm -hmm. and uh, getting to a point whereby you're like, I want to expand. I, I feel like I can, I can sell more meat. Okay, well, I got tired of sitting at the shop <laughs> and I just wanted more for myself. Mm -hmm. So I started networking with meat suppliers and learning the business and hoteliers. Then I got more, you know, I, I got interested because it seemed to me as though it was something that I could do. I, I, I had the business already running, the established business, and then I could um, have this as an added advantage or an added bonus. So that's how I, I did it. I started networking with the people, with the hoteliers, with the suppliers, understood the business and then got into it. And probably may I ask, what's your background? Like, what did you study? Marketing. Mar you studied marketing? <laughs> well, in, in university, I, mm -hmm. did, uh, I did sociology and economics. And then I took a course in uh, mid advertising and marketing. So that it was, it's very natural because I love to socialize. I love to go out there and meet new people. And, and so it was natural for me to progress into supply. Are there those who judged you that there you are, you know, beautiful girl with a degree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, not judged, but wondered, why mm -hmm. would you do this? But I, I love getting my hands dirty. I love knowing the ins and outs of whichever business I'm in. So I, I didn't think it was a problem to me at all and I enjoyed it you know I enjoyed meeting different people and just 
making money and of yeah. course selling meat and selling meat which is quite profitable <laughs> which is profitable yes yeah. i won't say quite but profitable but profitable so yes. right now you have the butchery still no i closed the business mm -hmm. yes and that's another thing that is very i, I closed the butchery but i i just had a now i just have a place where i supply from it's not really retail anymore so i have i have moved i have moved to supplies yes and who do you supply to so i supply to schools mostly right now and hotels so i have a few a few schools that i have supply and uh you based in nairobi so yes. in case there's a school watching in nairobi they could definitely reach please out call. to you <laughs> please call me <laughs> helping your sister out yes. and i really think your story is inspiring because for a lot of people the moral there first is recognizing opportunity yes when it comes along yeah. and then being prepared because success is opportunity meeting preparation mm -hmm. and then just ultimately for any young person usichagoe kazi kazi ni kazi and i yes. love how you put it you love getting your hands dirty yes. because a lot of the time success comes by actually working hard and working smart as well exactly Right, so my next guest is Eugene Bugwa. Eugene is a business owner and he's actually been touted as one of Kenya's youngest millionaires. So you've probably seen his story, but it's very important to actually meet him up close just to find out from him how did he get started and actually became smart enough with his money that he can actually confidently say that I am a millionaire. We, Eugene, welcome to the round table. Thank so we have to wrap this table, guys. Eh? And I'm just going to put it out there, guys. Like my <laughs> table is wrapped. <laughs> eh kama unafanya biashara ya kutengeleza meza ni nipigie simu tutafute meza ingine ya round table we've rubbed it too much but now uh, Eugene probably because anyone looking look watching this show right now they got attracted by the word young millionaire and probably with your earlier brand young rich yeah. but it's not been easy because you just don't wake up and literally grow from point zero to being a millionaire yeah. so probably tell us about your roots um I was born in in Kitale. Uh grew up in Tika, moved around quite a bit. Um a very underprivileged background, but I was lucky enough to get a good education. Um I went to St. Mary's for high school, then I went to um to USIU where I studied TV production, which is actually what I ended up doing. And while I was at USIU, I was uh I had started doing odd jobs on film sets. I discovered uh TV uh at the age of 17 just when I had finished high school. And a cousin of mine worked on the set of Inspector Mola. So I got on there as an extra and I really love that you could grow out your hair and people like went to work in t in t-shirts. <laughs> Just funny because I no longer go to work in t-shirts. Uh so but I really enjoyed the the concept of storytelling. Uh then I got another gig on his, on Macdonald Junction as an extra as well. But then we were fired for doing something cheeky on set, mm -hmm. which is not really firing because kama kazi ya mjengo you called on a day to day basis so we were no longer called. And a friend of mine and I set up a company to teach uh, film, basic film in private schools. So we taught in Makini School, we taught in St. Austin's. And while I was teaching there, I was still in USIU. This was first year of USIU. And often I didn't have enough transport to get from USIU to, to Makini School. So I'd get to the CBD and then walk. And while I was walking, you see all these nice apartments and all these guys driving in there. And I always wondered how they made money. So Absolutely. that's how the concept for Young Rich came about. Mm -hmm. So it turned out a lot of people were wondering how those guys made money. So we set up this show to... Um, profile young Kenyan millionaires who had made who had businesses uh, of worth 30 million shillings and over uh pitched the show around to a bunch of places got rejected a lot of times but then about 2013 which was two and a half years after I had come up with the concept uh, K24 bought into it uh it premiered on I think on a Friday 8 p.m. and I graduated the next day uh which was my mother was very relieved so there you are graduated <laughs> you have a job you're running a business yep. yeah And then so the first show ran for 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 about two and a half years on TV and we built on that uh, the money I earned from that show I invested in in more and now we have eight of them in a period of uh, I think five years we okay. have eight TV shows on all the channels except Citizen and Switch so <laughs> noted <laughs> <laughs> but looking at your journey because it's interesting that you worked with what you had. You didn't go around asking anyone for anything. You literally reflected. You're like, "What do I have? What can I bring to the table?" Yeah. And looking at every single thing you've done, that seems to be a recurring theme. That you're always very clear about what can Eugene bring to the table. Yeah. Uh so the the way it started was it's it's not entirely correct to say that I I did it by myself because I got some money from friends. I had two of my friends in university. Uh, so prior to prior to the TV show I had this other businesses small businesses that I ran around USIU I had a movie shop selling 50 movies I had 
place where guys could go in and play video games and i was saving up this small small money i was i was earning and from then on my thought was always i wanted to get into something that didn't require much capital uh because of course everybody sits there and says you can't raise capital in this country which is true but then what do you do do you go do you go home and sleep now most people also don't have that capital yeah. to risk yeah, yeah. so yeah. i think by the time i got some interest for young rich i had saved up maybe 70 80000 bob and i was able to convince two of my other friends where I, where I was in school with to borrow for me 100000 from their parents each oh. and i actually had to go to pitch to the parents um <laughs> And I was very lucky that uh, because at this point where I was borrowing the, the 200,000, I'd already invested my 70 and it was over and I was getting a commitment from the channel. And I want to ask you to just pause there because for anyone who's listening, you know, you, you're saying 70, 80, someone might be thinking this is way out of my league. Yeah. But I want to just highlight that it was not gifted. No. You had to go and pitch. Yeah. You know, all these are terms that come up when you're running a business. And I'm sure likewise for you as well. Yes. When you were initially thinking of buying your friend's business, mm -hmm. the money that you used, mm -hmm. was it given to you? Like, ulipigia mtu kawambia, sasa nataka kununua buchari, sasa nipatia ile pesa. No, actually, I had, I had saved my own money, and then I also got from family. Yes. So you had to earn it. Yes. And literally anyone that you got, you borrowed money from, from your family side, you had to pitch yes, as exactly. well. Yes, exactly. And yes. they had to test the viability of the of business. The business. Yeah. And they, they even came, they even checked out the premises and looked at, you know, my projections. I had to do a whole business plan and tell them what I planned for the business. And that's how I ended up in supply. So because they knew I had a, an, an end game. Basically here, nobody owes you anything. Everything is earned. And we're listening to young people just like you and I, and they're telling us about their smart money journey. So they are running successful businesses. He's very proud to be a millionaire. Let's talk about that. Eh? So this millionaire tag. <laughs> did you just wake know. up one day and decide, you know what, everyone in Kenya will know me as a millionaire. I did not choose this tag. Uh, I think where it came from is because in 2014, I was listed by Business Daily, uh, top 40 under 40. Then in 2016, and I think that's where the problem began, uh, Forbes listed me amongst the most promising entrepreneurs. That's Forbes Global in mm -hmm. Africa. Then in 2017, I was on the cover of Forbes with another Kenyan, Zamir Vaji. Um, so I do run a multi-million company, but I don't, that title I didn't give myself. I don't know who came up with it. And I think it came from the fact that you, you run a multi-million company. Yeah. Then it was like, he's a millionaire because he runs a multi-million company. company. So how many businesses do you own? The ones that I, uh, I, I actively run are three. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have some passive investments here and there, but the ones that I actively run are three. So that's uh, the TV production company, Young Rich TV, which we've now uh, just uh, rebranded to Documentary and Reality TV, which produces eight TV shows. And our shows are here, India, uh, South Africa, and a few other countries where we distribute to. Um, so that's what I do primarily every day. Then on the side, I also do run uh, number seven, the chain of buzz uh, in the CBD. Um, so you're in entertainment? Yeah, all that is entertainment. Yeah. Uh, then farming as well. Uh, I have a feedlot in Isenia. A very interesting mix. <laughs> it's a v farming is very different from the other ones because I've always, with TV, I've always felt like I sell air, which, which it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's something very satisfying about farming. I mean, you grow yes. this thing and then it feeds people. So you do crop farming? No, feedlot. I, it's beef. It's, uh, it's beef. Yeah, so, so it's, you, it's, you, it's you value addition. You buy the beef from the Maasai and you feed okay. them off for 90 days to become premium beef. Uh, then you sell to... Uh, so how big is your herd of cows? So we do between 15 and 30. We are on the fourth batch now. But the plan is, in this January actually, we are selling, we are offloading the, the fourth batch this month. We intend to now go to 100. Uh, and the, trick, the, the plan is to keep growing that until we can have our own abattoir and, and start aging. So did you see that? Like she sells meat? He has the cows. Like, you two need to have a conversation. Eh? <laughs> we, did. we did. Well, on that note, <laughs> we'll be taking a very quick break. We'll be right back as Eugene and Maureen wanongea kando. We want to make sure you guys get the best meat. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Real Talk Roundtable. Remember that you can always join the conversation by le letting me know what your views, questions, and comments are on today's topic. We are talking all about getting you started on your very own personal financial restructuring. Joining us right now is David Cairo, who is a financial advisor. Earlier on, we had from Eugene and Maureen, both young people who are successfully running their businesses. So you've talked about, about your roots, how you ended up into the different businesses that you had, and of course... He has cows, she sells meat, so obviously the chemistry here is very obvious. But now, I'm sure in both your areas, there are challenges. 
And it couldn't have been easy to get to a place whereby you can actually say, hey, you know what, I have a successful business. So let me start with you, Maureen. What are some of the challenges that you went through? I'd say my biggest challenge is cash flow. So something nobody tells you is that it's really hard to get into business, equally as hard to keep a business running, and sometimes even harder to get paid. So being a supplier that I am, you find sometimes that you have, you know, credit, you've offered extended credit to your customers and they haven't paid you for months on end. And Eugene wants money for his cows. Yes, exactly. But you've already sold the meat yes. and your clients have not paid. And haven't paid. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. So you've stuck between a rock and a hard place and that's when you, sometimes you have to dip into your, your savings, into your, the money in your pocket just to keep, to pay the workers to keep the business running. So those are things, those are, that's my biggest challenge, I'd say. Okay, and what yeah. about for you, Eugene? Because you're in multiple industries. Yeah. So I'm sure each industry comes with its own challenges. set of challenges. Yeah. With, uh, with the TV business, I'd, I'd say the biggest issue that we've had is we move much faster than, uh, than the current media industry. And, and as you know, because we've, we've, we've been in institutions like this. So we are constantly creating this, all these new shows. And uh, Kenya, by nature, is very traditional in, in what they do. So it's usually a tough sell for some of the concepts that we have. Uh, but nonetheless, we've been we've been able to still sell some of it. But at any given time, we have double of what uh, we have double the market can take. Uh, so what we've been now doing is because we've pretty much exhausted all of our possible clientele on the TV side. So now what we're doing is, is easy fix. We are now uh, going across the borders. Now with the other businesses, uh, so like the bar business, for example, it's, there's always an element of illegality. You've got all this government on you at mm. any given time for whatever reason. So the laws are always changing and you have to keep up. Not really changing. It's the rogueness of the people you deal with. Okay. Like, for example, uh, the noise pollution. The person is supposed to stand at so many meters and then measure the decibels. We have had guys come to our speaker right there and then fine you for it. So there's small, small issues like that. Yeah. Um, also expansion there because that's why I, I have had my biggest uh, business failure as of now. Uh, we, we set up, we expanded a bit too quickly and set up a new branch in Westlands. Lost all our money in eight months, like just down the drain. Um, yeah, on the farming side, uh, it's too early to really give you concrete answers on what my major challenges are uh, because we have a ready market and so far we, we're still piloting. So, but th th we don't view challenges as, as problems that we really need to obsess over. We view them as obstacles that we just need to solve and get it going. Give us some of the basic principles. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, once again, listening to your stories, uh, it's, it's quite it's inspiring considering that it's local and uh, you all started off uh, ideally uh, with in a new sector, new areas and have grown to where you are now. First and foremost, I'm, I'm grateful that they started small in terms of where you are. So I heard you talk of uh, savings for both of you, uh, regardless of the amount. For me, that's very important. And not just savings from nowhere, but where you worked up your savings, where you, you are involved in casual jobs here and there or any other work, you, whether it's work, you know, com blue collar, white collar job, but somehow you have a saving. Uh, then you look at that and then now you are able, like in your case, to convince your friends to then convince their parents yeah. who now brought you to their fall and you had to pitch to them, you had to work on your business plan and do that. For me, that's already two very important things where you start from where you are so that you're not starting from a place where uh, you expect other people, because in real sense, the world does not owe us anything. Mm -hmm. Entitlement, yes. yes. And I think a lot of young people, and I hate to say it, we do have young people who suffer from that. Yes. Mm -hmm. You feel entitled. Yes. I want to start a business. Nipatieni pesa ya kwanza biashara. I have a degree. Yes. You need to earn it. You have to earn it. Yeah. So, so for me, already that's very important. But then coming back now, for example, to the issue of working capital, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you had to learn it the hard way. Why? Because... Uh, I'm sure the lessons that it has taught you have the end with time helped you pan out and be able to be clear. For example, if this is what I'm paying, my, my payment terms with my supplier, how then does that affect my operations and then my also my payment terms to my, to my clients? Mm -hmm. So now you don't have a situation where you have money outstanding that is affecting your operations because that's one of the biggest challenges you can ever and face. And on that, maybe mm -hmm. just to take you back, when it comes to savings, so yes. here I am, Tamima, maybe I have my savings, I have 100,000 Kenya shillings, mm -hmm. so do I dump my entire savings okay. in the business's capital? Okay. Is that advisable? No. There, that depends with your risk appetite. So the, it's, there's no yes or no on that, but I would encourage, if, if you, I mean, if you have to you know, swim across, you must get to the deep end. So you must make the decision. The question is when. Uh, but, the, but the better answer to that question is never go into a business you don't understand. Mm -hmm. 
When and, I say you don't that understand... That was very clear from yes, the both of them. Yes. They did their research. You have to do your research, do your groundwork, understand. So don't, don't pour... The, you had better even pour the money of savings on research and development so that you acquire the skill and the knowledge and understanding prior to commencing business. Then commence and you have no knowledge and before you know you've sunk. So that's one... That, that, that's something that should be very, very clear. However, when you're running a business, one of the reasons why I, I would imagine someone like Eugene has been able to grow and expand to other businesses... I would expect and it's encouraged and it's advisable that for any business or any income, not even business, including today, maybe today you have pocket money, you're a student, you have a, you have a job, whether formal or informal, but you have an income, whatever source of income it is, as long as you've not stolen, but ideally you, you have an income. <laughs> we would expect or it is advisable to at minimum pay yourself. What does that mean? It means you save at least minimum of 10%. Now, the idea is that what you're saving is not what goes to paying other expenses call it uh, transport, call it food, call it a, a rent or anything. That does not, this is saving. Now, work for this saving, now invest it in a place that then it gets back for you something. Okay. Now, again, what it gives you, what we call its babies now, its, it's children, you also take another 10% at minimum and invest. Mm -hmm. So the idea is not to have a profitable business, take all that money, go on a vacation for three months, you're living large because your business is profitable. That idea means that you're, you're actually killing your own business. What, am I, what do I mean? You've seen many business people uh, uh, where you make money and the first thing you do is go and buy a car. Uh, thank you. I'm glad <laughs> we I all say the same I, I'm glad I didn't say the same <laughs> but, but now I can quote you that the yeah. first thing they buy is a car. What you're basically doing, you're actually stealing money from yourself because that money should have been for your working capital. Then tomorrow you're here, running to the bank manager or whoever, or the, you know, the, going back either to their own mobile phone and everything to borrow money to run your business. But the money you already spent is what you should have used to grow your business. So that you get to a place where, I'll give an example maybe. Uh, Mid-90s, I remember reading an article myself of then the richest man in the world, Bill Gates, where he was still CEO and chair of, of Microsoft. Then at, at the richest man of the world, he would re retain or, uh, of his dividends 70% for research and development, wow. 70. Wow. And only take home 30%. I can tell you, to the best of my knowledge, that has contributed to where Microsoft stands today at a global level. Because they're constantly innovating. Yes. yes. Mm. Yeah. So that's exactly what we're saying. So think of it this, and it's not about the amount. It has nothing to do with your, you've earned this last year, you made... 30 million or 3 billion, that's not the issue. The issue is whatever revenue you earn, what percentage do you take out and what percent do you plow back in the form of knowledge, knowledge management, in the form of, you know, growing the business. So that either equipment, equipping it or anything, or, build, or motivating your team, you know, growing your team and things like that. That's very important. And probably they both uh, shared very very important lessons because she mentioned that she bought a butchery but yes. she had to sell it off because she realized um, with time this thing is going to ban me Correct. but I could still stay in the same field mm -hmm. and st still sell meat basically. Mm -hmm. And for Eugene whereby his is more or less the opposite whereby he, he saw it, he admitted I saw it that if I stayed mm -hmm. I would literally be losing cash yes. but then because of conf overconfidence he stayed longer than he should have. Correct. So what advice do you give to anyone who's running a business when they reach this juncture whereby now you're seeing it worked for but now things are changing. Okay. Uh, maybe proximity, I, I go with her yeah. way of doing it. Uh, let's put it this way. Never be emotional about finances in life. Never. Money never knows you're spending it. Money is not aware that you, you even have it in the past. So don't be emotional about it. And the only place you lose money ever in life is when you bring emotions. And probably for you, Eugene, because looking back now, and you've been there, you've shared emotionally, it was very trying, yeah. but now when it comes to the business acumen, and you're running multiple businesses in different sectors. So where do you get that courage of deciding that, you know what, I feel like production, I'm good. I've conquered it. Clubs, yeah. I'm good. I've conquered it. Farming, I'm good. Now I want to do other things. So what keeps you going in that regard? I think I have a very high uh, risk appetite, as, mm -hmm. as what you mentioned. Uh, but above that, I like to win. I really like to win. It's, and if you see, like, I don't really go far beyond my scope. Uh, the club business and, and uh, the entertainment, they're all entertainment. So the only one that's really out of my, uh, my knowledge uh, scope is, is farming. And even there, I've partnered with a veterinary. So there's, it's, it seems risky, but it's very calculated risk uh, to a degree. And then when I go in, I, I do spend a lot of time trying to learn 
uh, what I'm doing. I'm just before this interview, I was thinking I was on the phone for almost 30 minutes with someone from my farm, just trying to understand like something very basic as the feeds. Uh, because you, 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 you don't go into anything and expect that it will work for you. You're, you're the one who has to do the work. Um, I'm constantly putting in a lot of hours just trying to understand the field that I am in. And of course, with more, with more knowledge, you get more confidence. Uh, like I think with TV now, because I've, doing, I've done it so repeatedly, I'm more, com I'm more confident about my decisions. I'm more confident about, say, taking a risk with something, as opposed to where you're taking those risks without knowledge. So I would say my confidence mostly comes from, from the knowledge itself. Okay. Yeah. And now back to finances. Would you advise people to take a loan to start a business? Uh, the answer is yes. However, that needs to be very well understood. The one is, number one, no, no one gives you money based on an idea. Mm -hmm. No one. So y you can even take the loan, but there's no one to give it to you just because you have a good idea. People will give you uh, based on mainly based on records, but that's for an existing business. But if it's a new one, then the records would be then be the business plan. So what do you have? And if you don't have a business plan, you can work on a strategic plan. But then you break down your first year by months. So then that. So yes, would I encourage? Yes. However, uh, the cost of the money then becomes the issue because you might end up working for the owner of the capital than working for yourself. Because you have to always, at one point, either there's collateral you give, so you have to, you're thinking of, you know, I need back, I need to pay back this loan. I need, so that can take up so much of your time as opposed to, however, as a business, many businesses exist on loans, so that's not a problem. But be very, very careful. And especially, uh, what is the nature? What's, how is the business incorporated? That's another thing to consider. Is it you? Is it a business name? Because then the, there's no difference between the owner and the business. Or is it an LTD? Because then it's a business that has taken the loan and not the individual. However, whichever case, the business takes the life of the owner. So if the owner is always on, on loans, you know, borrowing here and there and everything, then that means even their business will be like that. By There's extension. no way yeah, by extension. So it comes back down to training. Correct. And I think a lot of people will overlook this, that you might have this grand idea, but by and large, you mentioned it from a research and development, mm -hmm. but now when it comes just to running a business mm -hmm. and underst understanding probably banking, credit mm. facilities. What advice would you give to people? Because I tend to find that most people will tend to run their businesses from a point of ignorance, mm. hearsay. Mm. You've not really had a chance to understand it yes. deeply yourself. Mm. So, so the, the, the way it happens is uh, it's important for business people to appreciate that your work is not to do the job. In this case, it's not her work to sell the meat. That's not your work. It's not your work to do the production. However good you're good, in that field. That's not your work as an owner of a business or an entrepreneur. Your work is to build a system that can run that in your absence. That's what should give you sleepless nights. That you can sit there and you're building a system and the system is working. When I say system, I mean it's able to ensure that you know, you, you're able to source. So it's working with your partners, for example, your suppliers, your, your clients, you know, and it's able to ensure that uh, what, cli what do clients want, we know. And we're able to provide that as and when at the right price, right quality, right quantities, etc. That's the real work of a business person. So going into business just because either I saw Eugene doing it and it looks like it's, okay, young rich, I saw the program. Oh, and so-and-so is a millionaire. Because of doing this, I go into that. That's wrong. We call it uh, the, the paradox of attraction where you think that something is so attractive and before you know, it loses the valor because it, it wasn't original of me. So that's already a challenge. Then that's one of the reasons why people don't do well in business, even though they get the, because I can easily do a business plan, go to a banker, convince them and give me money. But I have, I don't even know what it is. I haven't invested in understanding, in knowledge. I'm also not willing to, you know, fold the sleeve, roll the sleeves and, and be able to put my, because like you had in our case, I'm sure I wouldn't be shocked if tomorrow I find her in, an over, in a white overall that, okay, let me say what <laughs> should be white, <laughs> even though it's blood. You know, because watch it, she's <laughs> you dealing know? with me. Yes, and before you know, and she's uko selling or in a freezer or something. She's now talking to me about, oh, I want to put up a, you know, a cold store or something like that. That for me means that then you're involved in the business. But and this thing and on that, because when yes. you mentioned that you're involved in the business, yes. I'm curious because you need good people and he's in multiple businesses, uh, you're running a whole supply chain. So how do you identify good people? Because I'm sure there are challenges with staffing. If you allow me to say this, uh, so slightly backtrack then answer your question. But some of the main challenges that SMEs will face, and one of the major ones, is getting the right fit in terms of human resources. Yes. That is quite a challenge. And this is, I'm saying this quoting research. So this is something we've done in research and we've come out with that. The other one is uh, strategy. Either they don't have 
a strategy. When I say they don't have, I don't mean that they don't strategize. I just mean that either it's just you know gathering some dust somewhere, if it is there in the first place, or uh, don't is not seen as important. And I'm curious, what is your experience with finding the right people? Well, human resources is a, is a really big challenge. So I've, I've been lucky on the TV side. A lot of the guys I started with uh, have grown with me, and they're now in the managerial positions. But I actually got quite frustrated some years back because it, it feels like we are constantly just advertising for jobs uh, because you've got people who are not very skilled in, in, in that field or the lack of discipline. But I think this is across across all, all businesses. So what we do now is uh, when we get good talent, of course, we train them and we try uh, to retain them by, by offering packs and, and ensuring that they enjoy the job that they do, that they're constantly challenged. Because you'll find that also a lot of talented people, it's not always just about the money. The work they do has to be challenging enough for them. Especially millennials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know if I have a solution for it. It's we are just constantly always looking to to up our talent, but then we also lucky like because we've had a few people who stuck with us and are really really good. And I found that usually if you have that thirty percent who's really really good and they're they're empowered enough, they will usually cover your shortfalls on the other seventy. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about for you, Maureen? Well, I've had my challenges with 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 stuff. Um, let me give you a short story. One time, I had hired someone. I had two workers at the butchery, and one of them stole from me. And when I say they stole, they stole all the machines. You know, th the butcher ran late. So they would um, work until about 10, 10, 30, 11. So obviously I leave around 6. And at that time, uh, the guy decides, you know what, I'm going to steal from this lady. And he just, he took all my machines, all my machines, and I was left, and I had to start again. So stuff is really, really hard. And it's one of those things that you just have to pray to God, mm -hmm. get somebody, and then when you get a good one, you stick with them for a while. You, it's a trial and error. It's a challenge you have to take. Okay, and yeah. finally, as we wind up Cairo mm. to our would-be future business owners, because mm. they've been inspired by Young Rich here, Mr. Eugene, you know, <laughs> he's the millionaire on the table. <laughs> and of course, uh, we've had her story as well. And I think the moral here is, and what I love is that nobody here comes from a silver spoon background. Mm -hmm. They've all worked for it, they've all earned it. So it's very possible for anyone who's watching from home. So picking up from that, what is that one golden tip that you would give them? So I'll, I'll say that go into business to offer solutions. That means you identify problems and you're bringing a solution. Don't go into business for any other reason. Uh, because any other reason will then deviate you from that goal. But the moment you are able to understand there's a, there's a problem here and I can get a solution. And now work on your solution to make it so unique, uh, convenient, affordable, accessible, you know, to ensure that you're doing it for the client. Before you know, it attracts. So the money you're looking for or the, or, the, or the results or the winning you're looking for then ends up coming. That's my advice to anyone. What about you, them. Eugene? How can you all become millionaires? <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say the first step, I think, is to, to pick, pick your path. And because the, the, I, I don't think that the purpose of life is really to, to, be, to be rich, it's to find happiness. And happiness is different for different people. Uh, for me, it's winning and money is a nice way to keep score. Mm -hmm. But and you're willing to put in the <laughs> hard work Yes, you're really putting to the hard work, but then also just go for what you think will make you happy because there's some people who will just be really happy being nuns, for example. Mm -hmm. There's some people you find who are really, really happy being uh, cobblers. Uh, if growing up, uh, you always knew that cobbler in the, in the neighborhood was very passionate about what they do. Mm -hmm. Because I find that if you, if you enjoy what you do, then success is in, in the satisfaction of doing it every day. Uh, when, but as, as with everything, there's discipline, there's commitment. Uh, I mean, you, you, don't, you don't sleep and expect that things will work out in your favor. Uh, there's timekeeping, there's, and often if you do the same thing for a long time, you have a higher chance of, of being successful at it than, than if someone else who's just jumping from place to place. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about from you, Maureen, finally? Um, I think, first of all, you must, have, you must have perseverance because business is full of challenges. And secondly, you just have to do it. You know, you, you would sit, and when, you, when, when he talked about um, knowledge and research, it's not about getting research from the internet. Go out into the field, go there, sit with people who know, and that's how you gather experience. And then don't be afraid, you know. It's one of those things where you, you, cannot, you can sit and theorize about learning to swim, but until you actually get into the water, that's when you know how to swim. So you just have to jump in, jump in take that risk. Well, there you've had it. Well, on that note, I really do hope that we've given you some wonderful tips about how you could actually get started on your journey of starting your own business and running it successfully. Thank you so much to my guests, of course, for sharing their stories. We wish you well. Thank and you. Uh, I, again, 
you know, opportunities. <laughs> like she said, talk to people. You never know. That whole thing of no new friends, it gets to a point you'll realize that the greatest resource you will have is at the end of the day your network. Your network ends up becoming your network. So talk to other people, you know, collaborate where you can. And of course, take your lessons, learn them and build on them. So right now it's time for a very quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the round table. So our conversation on today's topic continues. We are telling you how you can actually get started on your very own personal financial restructuring. So let me introduce who's on the table with me right now. I have Waidaka Gatumia from Centonomy and I also have Miss Rina Hicks, famously known for telling my audience with 1000 <laughs> Kenya shillings. <laughs> Come and see me. I'll tell you where to invest. Yes. So that is the reason I have her here today on the round table. But before that, because obviously, as you know, we have two shows. We have a real talk with Tamima, where, of course, I have the huge audience. And they talk about different issues. And we have the round table, where it's more intimate. So today, what we're trying to do is basically just to connect the shows. The shows because our first show of the year, and literally the day kid, was talking about smart money. And we got amazing feedback from you, which I have with me here. And I'm just going to be reading some of the questions from our viewers. And just hoping that these questions actually do educate you and actually help you make better informed decisions on your finances. So earlier on, because uh, we are talking about people who run businesses and talking about how to have a smart business. So now when it comes to personal finances, and I want to talk about loans. So I'm going to read a question here that, uh, and several questions just to do with loans, because I, I, I was shocked to see some of the things that people would actually take loans for. So I have here someone saying, uh, hey, Tamima, uh, this is John. John is was watching us from Rongai, and she took a loan for her birthday party. Na hajamaliza kulipa. Alafu kuna mungine apa, and I tua Anne from Nanyuki. Anna nasema she used to borrow a loan to pay another. Lakini interest rates have hit her so hard, and she sacrificed a lot to pay off the debts, and now her business is in a better place. So she learned her lesson. And then as well, someone here said, Hi Tamima, my name is John. I borrowed a loan to pursue my studies and I'm still hoping to pay this loan when I finish with my studies. Then uh, Amina here, I also borrowed from many apps at first. I was able to pay, but now things have gone wrong. I have not paid most of them and I'm really stressed. So let's talk about the loan because I have even here Stella saying I borrowed a loan of 50000 for my husband to start a business. But all of a sudden, my husband, Ameni Ruka, then uh, someone else has then borrowed a loan stock for my business. So what do you take a loan for? Because kuna watu wanaumia, natena sana. Rina? So, wale wanaumia, I'm very sorry. I, it's, it's very, taking a loan and having debt over your shoulders can be very stressful. So, um... You know, we take loans for buying assets, ideally. You want to take a loan to buy an asset that will either bring in a cash flow or grow in value, which you can then sell and generate an income. Um, or perhaps you can take a loan if you're in business uh, where, you know, you want to supply some item or you are in, say, f the food business and you get a contract that is bigger than your usual typical contracts and you need money for working capital. So it's okay to borrow to then meet that need and then you pay back because there's sort of sight of where you will get money to pay back your loan. So just to clarify some of the items that people have listed. So here again, yes. I took a loan to buy land. What I remained, I bought a car. I'm now having a hard time to pay my debt. I took a loan to buy a new phone, yeah. but now I'm supposed to pay triple the value of the loan that I took. So to Meskia Gari, mm. opening businesses for husbands, birthday parties, uh, paying for school fees, to buy stock. So looking at some of those things I've listed, like what are those obvious ones that is just a flat out no? Like if you take a loan to serve that desire, because it's a desire. All of them. <laughs> okay, all of them. <laughs> you know, so, so uh, first of all, birthday, wedding, a phone. I mean, all those things that are Vitu just consumables. Vitu Zanyumba Viti, there's somebody who actually on the show said that she w took a loan to buy s couches. Mm. There's some things you can take time to save for and buy. They're not necessary. They're desires. They're desires. For school is a bit tricky. Uh, and for school, I think, you know, it's okay to take a loan, especially if you are, so say, like, maybe Tamima, you need, if you did a course for, you know, production, you would increase your ability to get an income. It's okay to borrow with sight of being able to get money to pay it back. But even as you borrow, 
you're not just borrowing and imagining that somehow somewhere somebody's going to give you money and money will just appear mm. you need to know that even if i'm borrowing for a business i have access to money that if this business doesn't work out i'll be able to pay back that loan because if the business collapses then how am i going to be pay back that loan so it's worst case scenario Okay, that sounds, I think for a lot of people it's like, Rina, what are you saying? <laughs> I need the loan to get the education, to get the job. But if I cannot pay it off without the job, so don't take a loan? So then borrow from someone who then is going to be a little more flexible. See, the problem is somebody will go to an app, right, to borrow. I saw Tala being oh, mentioned here Yes, Tala branch, there are many, yeah. there are over 50. Now, you go to those and you have to pay within a month, right? Or you go to a bank and within a month, you're, they're already waiting for interest and a bit of principal to pay back if you're borrowing for things like that you need to borrow from somebody who will not expect money within a month and who can wait perhaps six months who will give you what we call a moratorium a period of time within which you can take your time and pay me back and even when you pay me back you can pay me a thousand now then ten thousand then fifty thousand i mean it's easy but not an institution that requires you to pay a certain amount of money within a strict period of time. Right now we have 500,000 young people below the age of 35 in Kenya who are listed by CRB, who will not be able to borrow even when they actually need it because they have defaulted on those loans that we think is just dollar, it's just a branch. And maybe on that, let me ask Waidaka this because <laughs> early on when we were talking about the things that Rina was very, uh, Rina was very clear, do not borrow to, for a birthday party, mm -hmm. for your boyfriends, mm -hmm. to buy a dress, to go for a wedding. Let's start from just the basics because I remember when we were in school, we were taught about needs. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what are the needs? What are our basic needs? Because I kind of feel like you could borrow for a need potentially vis-a-vis -vis borrowing for a desire. Mm -hmm. So what are the needs? Okay, your question is kind of broad. <laughs> I think everyone, everyone has mm -hmm. different needs and I think it's to understand what are, what are the basics. I think you need to eat, you need to live yeah. and generally you need education uh, to be able to function in this society. Um, I, I will add something else. You, ne you, you need to enjoy life. And, and, but the problem is that we often want to get the enjoyment without doing the work. And that's where, the, that's where we get into this uh, discussion that we're having right now. I want that TV now. I don't want to wait to build up enough capital to buy that TV. That's the issue. I want that phone now. It has just come out. It's now in the market. Everyone will think I am the guy because I have that phone. And so I want it now instead of saying, how can I build up to that point? I think what really, really is getting me right now is because we, we kind of don't have a sense of purpose. I don't think we see five years down the, the road. We see now. Mm -hmm. I want things right now. I want to be, I think it was Eugene was on the show. Mm -hmm. Just, I want to be him. You didn't listen to his story, which started off, I started selling DVDs. No one wanted to be Eugene when he was selling DVDs. And I'm <laughs> sure there are many guys at USIU who didn't want to be that guy at that yeah. point. So I know I've taken a long way to answer your question about what the needs are, but it's, for each person it's different. I think on the show we, we had a, a wonderful lady who was speaking about her experience about uh, she needed to move house to a more expensive place because she needed security. You see, we can say, sit here as analysts and say, pay as little as much as possible on rent, but I can't tell her that. She wants safety for herself and for her kids. So in her case, her need is security. And so therefore, she'll pay more for it. You must find the purpose for your need. Thank you. Because we, we all have needs. Yes. We are all very clear about that. Yes. But what is the purpose for your need? Why exactly. do you need that? Mm. Yeah? Exactly. So by the time you're going to borrow, Thank you. you're pretty sure that it is serving its purpose. Its need. So how do you eliminate that? If right now you're in a situation whereby, where mm -hmm. you kwa estate, unajifungia, you know, you're a night runner because yeah. umomba jirani, umomba bank, umomba apps, yeah. then you've extended all your lines of credit. So how do you help this individual actually? It just is the system, Tamima. Number one, stop borrowing. Okay. This idea of borrowing from one from Peter, is it to PayPal? Is that mm. the, the saying? Mm. Yeah. Just keep borrowing th that cycle. Never, so just stop. Then do an assessment of where you are right now. Find out what do you actually need for life. One of the things that people don't know is even where their money goes. So start off by first of all understanding where does my money actually go. Once you've done that for a period of time, we, we, we usually ask people for one month, just simply write down where your money goes. Don't judge yourself. Buy the same things you usually buy. Go out the same way you used to. And then come back after one month and look at it and make some decisions. I actually and did that. Yes. And it's very eye-opening. It <laughs> is. Sure. I mean, like, yes. I'm sure you'll tell the viewers what you spent <laughs> on in a few minutes just now. But 
Once you have that in front of you, then you can make decisions. Yeah. And when you're making a decision, it is to say, how can I pay my debt down as quickly as possible? Thank God for the Consumer Protection Act, which now you can pay back your debt earlier without penalties. Mm. So put as much money as possible into repaying the loan, because as soon as the, the sooner you can pay it off, the less in interest you're going to be able to pay. So we usually talk about the fact that, in fact, if you have debt, it's, it's usually... Often it is better to pay off that debt first before even now start thinking to go and put your money in an investment because that debt is 13% in this country at least guaranteed and you know this year most likely it's going to go up. Yeah. It's 13% guaranteed but all the investments as we said last time there's no investment that has a guaranteed return. So if you can handle your debt and then begin slowly to get into the investment space that's what we're talking about. Focus by first of all understanding where your money is going putting as much as possible back into the repayment and stop, stop, stop borrowing to mm. pay another loan. Okay. Tamim, allow me to add. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is a system that mm. has been proven to work. Mm. Once you've done what he has said by actually understanding where your money is going, look at what assets you have. Somebody came for, to me uh, from a bank. He works in a bank, has all these loans that we are talking about here, owes his mother-in-law, owes <laughs> many people. And I asked him, how much is that watch on your hand? Sometimes we don't think about what we have ourselves. What do you have at home? Do you have a bed that you're sleeping on? Can you sleep on a mattress for a while? Sell your couch, sell, sell assets to help you pay back. So purpose to clear purpose the debt. Purpose to clear mm. the debt. But yeah. even as you clear the debt, list the debt. From the smallest to the largest. Start with, who do you owe? Is it the shopkeeper outside? Then is it the bank? Is it the circle? And how much do you owe each and every one of those, those people? Call them and tell them, I'm sorry, I have defaulted. Mm -hmm. I had promised to pay 5K, mm -hmm. I have not paid. Once you've checked how much mm -hmm. you're spending, then you know, okay, I can actually put aside 10 Gs every month to pay my debt. Call every one of them and tell them, I am willing and can pay you 2,000 every month and I promise I'm paying this back. Or I can pay 20,000 every month towards this loan. Negotiate minimum payments with each and every one of them and then start paying. But the smallest debt, you're not going to pay the minimum amount. Those things you're selling, any extra income you can earn to be able to attack this debt, attack the smallest. And then use that money once you've paid the smallest to attack the second in that sort of system. Because that way, you, when you start with the smallest one, you will get psych to start paying off the others. And you'll be consistent. Because once you paid this one, you don't now spend the money. Yeah. You've cleared, you use that money to pay off the next one and it becomes... You know, it, it becomes a bigger, bigger amount, and you're able to pay off your debt in quite a okay. quick time. Okay, and now when it comes to perhaps when, you, when you've uh, borrowed from an institution, perhaps like a bank. So, what opportunities exist in terms of sort of like buying time if you're late? What Rina said just payments. now, so, Tamima, shocking students in our class. They feel like you know, once you've taken a loan, you feel like that's the end of the world. Exactly. Everyone is after me. Call the bank. Exactly. Yeah. We've, you will be surprised by the lending institutions and the kind of leeway they can be able and to I give really you. I really feel you, that's you, what people needed to hear. Please call them. Yeah. There was a lady who, who had a loan from a SACO and a, and a loan from a bank. And she was running. In fact, she didn't even want to attend the debt class. And I had to call and say, please come. When we, st when we spoke to her, she said, okay, I'll call them. She called and said, look, I'm in a tough place. I cannot be able to repay. My kids are going back to school, all these various things. What can you do to help me? She asked them, actually, honestly, what can you yeah. do? Can you imagine the bank said, mm. we give you six months, no interest, figure yourself out, and then come back after six months and we begin again from where we are. You see that for six months, there was no stre the, the stress left. Mm. She, the, 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 don't, the loan had not gone, but for a period of time, she was given enough space to be able. This idea of, yes, mm. the idea of hiding is the worst idea. Yeah. Call your debtors and say, I'm in trouble. Mm. I, ca I don't know what I'm going to do. Give me some time to figure this out. Because this idea of running away from your responsibilities does not work. It doesn't solve anything. Even the institutions, and you will be surprised how much leeway they have to be able to assist. They can you. even amalgamate all those loans. And your Tala loan, what, what, what. Yes. Every loan you have, they'll, then you restructure, increase yeah. the period of time, Correct. reduce the minimum payments, and it will be comfortable for you. Correct. And probably now, uh, again, investment. So we've talked about loans. So how do you invest? Because... If you have good investments, as Rina was saying, that, you know, sell off your assets, perhaps you've invested somewhere, that money has matured. So what are, what are some of those small places that anybody, and I, when I say anybody, like you said, with a thousand shillings, mm -hmm. you could literally start your investment journey? Um, so even with a hundred shillings, by the way. Miss Pia, a hundred bob. You can invest. I think even with ten shillings, depending on who you're well, talking I, to. Yeah. Well, you know, you, 
business is an investment. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And we have a guru here who invests small, uh, medium and, uh, enterprises on, on businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, owners on how they can grow their business. A business is an investment. And so right now, you know, I, I remember a year ago, I needed to buy, I have three kids and I needed to buy clothes for playing because these guys, they fall, their torn clothes, their trousers, they just tear all the time. I said, come down. I can't buy clothes for 3,000. I went to Gikomba. Do you know how much t-shirts are there? And nice ones, polo shirts, mm. and nice jeans, 30 bob. The most I spent on clothes was 50 shillings. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's crazy, but you get really cheap things. Now, for people who can't go to Gikomba, you can buy for them nice ones, wash them nicely, iron, and sell at 200 bob. You've bought at 30 shillings, one top. You buy 300 bob, you have 10. You go sell at 1,000 each. Excuse me, see, and how much money did you need? Only for transport? With a thousand shillings, you can do amazing things. This, if you want to go to the formal financial assets sector, we can also do many things. Mm. You can have a SACO account and start to save towards the SACO. With the SACO, you'll be able to borrow and do business. With the SACO, you earn dividends on your money from 8 to 10%, some even 12%, but it varies. Yeah. So say on average about 8 9% a year. You can also, we have a company um, that exists called Zimele asset management. It is regulated and licensed by the Capital Markets Authority and the Retirement Benefits Authority. You can put in 100 bob, 200 bob. Every, you send with M-Pesa if you want, right? So there's opportunities for everybody. The stock market, with 3,300 shillings today on average, you can buy 100 shares of Safaricom. So you don't need a lot of money to start to invest. The key thing is to decide and do it frequently. I think the problem people have is not having a goal. And if you don't have a goal, and, you're, and you will spend everything you earn. But until you decide, it's like watching or deciding to play soccer. You tell your son, let's play soccer, but there's no scoring. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, from you, Cairo, <laughs> when it comes to investment, as we uh, wrap up. Investment, you have to consider, look at it this way. In investment, you're paying yourself what you want. Absolutely. It's not the same as not investing. Yeah. In investment, you pay yourself. You may not pay yourself today, mm. You'll invest today, but you'll pay you at some point. Down the line. Down the line. So the only thing, but back to the loans because of what you're talking about. People are in loans because in life you only have to, you can only be in any, any one category. You either consume or produce. If you consume, you spend. So you take money out and give. Mm. If you produce, you earn the money. So the problem is, unfortunately, and I cannot blame anyone who is in, uh, indebted in this country, we are not educated around this prior so to consumerism has consumerism has taken production. over yes mm. yeah. but it's not an excuse on the other hand you can learn and that's why we're having discussions like this and bring it to an end and i'm saying this also because since 2013 to now i'm glad to say i have no loan so that's why i didn't want to answer the question of credit i don't <laughs> i don't have a loan and i don't well take put. when i say I don't take it means if i'm going somewhere and i don't have fuel i don't have fare i won't i won't i don't ask my anyone for money what, how I decide something is a need is when I can get money for it or not. Mm. And I really do hope that you've learned like from that. this wonderful conversation that we've had here. It's all about smart money and, of course, restructuring your personal finances. So there are just some basic tips that, you know, you may think that you know, but you need to hear over and over again until you get the discipline of understanding that your money should work for you. And, of course, you should also just secure your future and your family's future. Well, that's all the time we have here on The Roundtable. Thank you so much for choosing to stay with us. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your viewing. Special thanks to E-Plus for medic and ambulance services.